And we're continuing with the 39th chapter of David Copperfield by Charles Dickens, which is called Wickfield and Heap. Uriah Heap and David Copperfield are out for a walk as David wants to send a letter to Dora's aunts, who she's living with since her father has died. But Uriah Heap is concerned that this all has to do with him being a rival for his affections toward Agnes. Do you set a watch upon Miss Wickfield and make her home no home because of me, said I. Oh, Master Copperfield, those are harsh words, he replied. Put my meaning into any words you like, said I. You know what it is, Uriah, as well as I do. Oh, no, you must put it into words, he said. Oh, really, I couldn't myself. Do you suppose, I said, constraining myself to be very temperate and quiet with him on account of Agnes, that I regard Miss Wickfield otherwise than as a very dear sister? Well, Master Copperfield, he replied, you perceive I am not bound to answer that question. You may not, you know, but then you see you may. Anything equal to the low cunning of his visage and his shadowless eyes without the ghost of an eyelash I never saw. Come then, said I, for the sake of Miss Wickfield. My Agnes, he exclaimed with a sickly angular contortion of himself. Would you be so good as to call her Agnes, Master Copperfield? For the sake of Agnes Wickfield, heaven bless her. Thank you for that blessing, Master Copperfield, he interposed. I will tell you what I should, under any other circumstances, as though thought of telling to Jack Ketch. To who, sir? said Uriah, stretching out his neck and shading his, uh, his ear with his hand. To the hangman, I returned to the most unlikely person I could think of, though his own face has suggested the illusion quite as a natural sequence. I am engaged to another young lady. I hope that contents you. Upon your soul, said Uriah. I was about indignantly to give my assertion the confirmation he required when he caught hold of my hand and gave it a squeeze. Oh, Master Copperfield, he said, if you had, if you only had the condescension to return my confidence when I poured out the, fu the fullness of my heart, I should, n I never should have doubted you. As it is, I'm sure I'll take off mother directly, and only too aptly. I know you'll excuse the precautions of affection, won't you? Before we leave the subject, you ought to understand, said I, that I believe Agnes Wickfield to be as far above you and as far removed from your aspirations as the moon it's, as the moon herself. Peaceful, ain't she? said Uriah. Very. Now confess, Master Copperfield, that you haven't quite that you haven't liked me quite as I have liked you. All along you have thought me too humble now, I shouldn't wonder. I am not fond of professions of humility, I returned, or professions of anything else. There now, said Uriah, looking flabby and lead-coloured in the moonlight. Didn't I know it? But how little you think of the rightful humbleness of a person of, in my station, Master Copperfield. Father and me was both brought up at a foundation school for boys, and mother, she was likewise brought up at a public school, sort of charitable establishment that taught us a deal of humbleness, not much else that I know of, from morning to night. We was to be humble to this person and humble to that, and to pull off our caps here, and to make bows there, and always to know our place, and abuse ourselves before our betters. And we had such a lot of betters. Father got the monitor metal for be by being humble. So did I. Father got made a sexton by being humble. He had the character among the gentlefolks of being such a well-behaved man that they were determined to bring him in. Be humble, Uriah, says father to me, and you'll get on. It was what was always being dinned into you and me at school. It's what goes down best. Be humble, says father, and you'll do. And really, it ain't done bad. I am very humble to the present moment, Master Copperfield, but I've got a little power. He said all this, I knew, as I saw his face in the moonlight, that I might understand. He was resolved to recompense himself by using his power. I had never doubted his meanness, his craft, 
and malice, but I fully comprehended now for the first time what a base, unrelenting, and revengeful spirit must have been engendered by this early and this long suppression. Whether his spirits were elevated by the communication I had made of him, or by having indulged in this retrospect, I don't know, but they were raised by some influence. He talked more at dinner than was usual with him, asked his mother off duty from the moment from the moment of our re-entering the, the house, whether he was not growing too old for a bachelor, and once looked at Agnes so that I would have given all I had to leave to knock him down, for leave to knock him down. When we three males were left alone after dinner, he got into a more adventurous state. He had taken little or no wine, and I, pre and I presume it was the mere insolence of triumph that was upon him, flushed, perhaps, by the temptation my presence furnished in its exhibition. I had observed yesterday that he tried to entice Mr. Wickfield to drink, and interpreting to look with Ag which, and interpreting the look which Agnes had given me as she went out, had limited himself to one glass, and then proposed that we should follow her. I would have done so again today, but Uriah was too quick for me. We seldom see our present visitor, sir, he said, addressing Mr. Wickfield, sitting a contrast to him at the end of the table, and I should propose to give him welcome in another glass or two of wine, if you have no objections, Master Copperfield. Your elf and happiness. I was obliged to make a show of taking the hand he stretched across to me, and then, with very different emotions, I took the hand of the broken gentleman, his partner. Come, fellow partner, said Uriah, if I may take the liberty. Now suppose you give us something of another appro appropriate to copper, or another appropriate to Copperfield. I did pass over Mr. Wickfield's proposing my aunt, his proposing Mr. Dick, his proposing Doctor's Commons, his proposing Uriah, his drinking everything twice, his conscientiousness of his own weakness, the ineffectual effort that he made against it. It made me sick at heart to see. Come, fellow partner, said Uriah at last. I'll give you another one, and I humbly ask for bumpers, seeing I intend to make it the divinest of her sex. Her father had his, had his empty glass in his hand. I saw him set it down, look at the picture she was, she was so like, put his hand on his forehead and shrink back in his elbow chair. Agnes, said Uriah, either not regarding him or not knowing what his nature of action was. Agnes Wickfield is, I am safe to say, the divinest of her sex. May I speak out among friends? To be her father is a proud distinction, but to be her husband. Spare me from ever again hearing such a cry as that which made her father rose up, as that which made her father rose up from the table. What's the matter? said Uriah, turning a deadly color. You are not gone mad after all, Mr. Wickfield, I hope. If I say I have an ambition to make your Agnes my Agnes, I have as good a right to it as another man. I have a better right to it than any other man. I had my arms around I had my arms around Mr. Wickfield, imploring him by everything I could think of, oftenest by his love for Agnes to calm himself a little. He was mad for the moment, his face all staring and distorted, a frightful spectacle. I besought him to think of Agnes, to recollect how Agnes and I had grown up together, how I honored her and loved her, how she was his pride and joy. I may have affected something, or his wildness may have spent itself. But at length he said, I, I know, Trotwood, my darling child and you, I know, but look at him. He pointed to Uriah, pale and glowering in a corner, evidently very much out of his calculations and taken by surprise. Look at my torturer, he replied. Before him I have, step by step, abandoned name and reputation, peace and quiet house and home. I have kept your name, reputation for you, and your peace and quiet, and your house and home too, said Uriah with a sulky, hurried, defeated air of compromise. Don't be foolish, Mr. Wickfield. I have gone a little beyond what you were prepared for. 
I can go back, I suppose. There's no harm done. I looked for single motives in everyone, said Mr. Wickfield, and I was satisfied I had bound him to me by motives of interest. But see what he is. Oh, see what he is. You had better stop him, Copperfield, if you can, cried Uriah with his long finger pointing toward me. He'll say something presently, mind you. He'll be sorry to have said afterwards, and you'll be sorry to have heard. Oh, say anything, cried Mr. Wickfield with a desperate air. Why should I not be in all the world's power if I am in yours? He dropped into a chair and weakly sobbed. The excitement into which he had been roused was leaving him. Uriah came out of his corner. I don't know. I don't know all I have done in my fatuity, said Mr. Wickfield, putting out his hands as if to depreciate my condemnation. He knows best, meaning Uriah Heep, for he has always been at my elbow, whispering me, you see the millstone that he has about my neck. You find him in my house. You find him in my business. You heard him but a little time ago. What need have I to say more? You haven't need to say so much, nor half of much, nor anything at all, observed Uriah half defiant and half fawning. You wouldn't have took it up so if it, if it hadn't been for the wine. You'll think better of it tomorrow, sir. If I have said too much, or more than I meant, what of it? I haven't stood by it. The door opened and Agnes, gliding in without a vestige of color in her face, put her arm round his neck and steadily said, Papa, you're not well. Come with me. He had laid his head upon her shoulder as if he were opposed, or as if he were oppressed with heavy shame, and went out with her. Her eyes met mine for but an instant, yet I saw how much she knew of what had passed. I didn't expect he'd cut up so rough, Master Copperfield, said Uriah, but it's nothing. I'll be friends with him tomorrow. It's for his good. I'm humbly anxious for his good. I gave him no answer and went upstairs into the quiet room where Agnes had so often sat beside me at my books. Nobody came near me until late at night. I took up a book and tried to read. I heard the clock strike twelve and was still reading, without knowing what I read when Agnes touched me. You will be going early in the morning, Trotwood. Let us say goodbye now. She had been weeping. But her face then was so calm and beautiful. Dear Agnes, I said, is it presumptuous for me, who am so poor in all in all in which you are so rich, goodness, resolution, all noble qualities, to doubt to, or direct you. But you know how much I love you, how much I owe you. You will never sacri sacrifice yourself to a mistaken sense of duty, Agnes. More agitated for a moment than I had ever seen her, she took her hand from me and moved a step back. Oh, long, long afterwards, I saw that look subside as it did now into the lovely smile with which she had, with which she told me she had no fear for herself. I need have none for her, and parted from me by the name of brother, and was gone. It was dark in the morning when I got upon the coach at the inn, at the inn door. The day was just breaking when we were about to start, and then, as I sat thinking of her, came struggling up the coach side, through the mingled day and night, Uriah's head. Copperfield! said he in a croaking whisper as he hung by the iron of the roof. I thought you'd be glad to hear before you went off that there are no squares broken between us. I've been into his room already and we've made it all smooth. Why though I'm, un why I'm, un why though I'm humble, I'm useful to him, you know, and he understands his interest when he isn't in liquor. What an agreeable man he is, after all, Master Copperfield. I obliged myself to say that I was glad he had made an apology. Oh, to be sure, said Uriah. When a person's humble, you know what's an apology. So easy, I say, I suppose, with a jerk. You have sometimes plucked a pear before it was ripe, Master, Copperpe Master Copperfield. I suppose I have, I replied. I did that last night, said Uriah. But it'll ripen yet. It only wants attending to. I can wait. Profuse in his farewells, he got down again as the coachman got up. For anything I know, 
he was eating something to keep the raw morning air out, but he made motions with his mouth as if the pear were ripe already, and he was smacking his lips over it, and that is the end of chapter 39.